Hello and welcome to today's Partner Infopedia web conference. This is Dynamics 365 Fast Track Tech Talk. Today's topic, solution development. Kicking us off today from Microsoft, we have Katie Havilis, who is a senior Fast Track program manager. Now it's my pleasure to hand you over. Katie, you now have the floor. Thank you, Debbie. Hi, everyone. I'm going to briefly go through today um, our session objection uh, objectives. So it's, it's the solution development workshop tech talk. Um, the first part of this will be customization overview. Um, then we'll transition into extending Dynamics 365, and we'll round this up with best practices, um, solution lifecycle recommendations, and leave some time at the end for additional questions and answers. Um, the session will run about two hours, and the overall outcomes are to learn the basics of customizing and extending Dynamics 365 and covering uh, best practices on how to do so. If you have any questions throughout the session, as Debbie said, feel free to pop those in the chat window, and we'll try to address them as the questions arise. And, um, and at the end, again, like I said, we'll have some time for some additional Q&A. So we'll kick this off with customization. So in this first section, we're going to cover how to manage and deploy customizations within Dynamics 365. We'll review customization of entities, which is sometimes also referred to as configuration. And this will include things such as how to add additional fields, forms, and relationships. We'll also walk through how to implement business rules within the application. Um, how to present this information, um, not only in forms, but also in views. Um, and we'll also review how to export and import solutions, um, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail, but basically how to move your customizations through different environments. Right. Okay, so the first thing we're going to cover today is um, the concept of a solution. Okay, so a solution is essentially a container for customizations. It allows you to package up the modifications that you've made um, into an organized set so that you can export those and move them into different environments. Okay. Um, Solutions are not required. Um, by default, when you deploy um, a new instance of Dynamics 365 um, and you go into the customization section, there's um, what's called the default solution. You don't see this in the solution list, um, but this is where all of your modifications um, are, uh, are deployed into, regardless of whether you do it directly through the customization section or whether you do it within the context of a custom solution. Um, so a solution is a means of organizing the customizations that you make within the system. Um, and again, allows you to move those between um, different environments. A solution also allows you to associate what's referred to as a publisher. And this is a good way of tracking kind of who made customizations. It puts a prefix in front of fields. Um, that you create in the system, as well as custom entities. And um, you'll typically also see this if you are to purchase um, or deploy a managed solution from one of our ISVs as well. Um, solutions can be exported from an environment as either an unmanaged solution or a managed solution. Okay, and there's pros and cons to both types of solutions, and they apply to different scenarios. Okay, and this is something that you want to give careful planning to, and we'll cover this in a little bit more detail um, further on in the session. Okay. The default solution that's um, created as part of the instance provisioning contains all of the system components within the application. All of your custom components are also, as I mentioned before, automatically um, merged as part of the default solution. So the solution contains 
all your configurations that you've added to it, as well as um, the customizations you've made and um, various system settings. Okay. It's authored, as I mentioned, by a publisher. Okay. And um, it's used, again, for moving these between different deployments. So, for example, you might have, um, you might have created a solution in your development environment, and that has a set that might contain both system entities as well as custom entities, um, fields, forms, views, um, web resources that you've created in the system. And then you can export that solution and move it up to your next level environment. So that might be your test environment. So you can export the solution, import it into your target environment, and then those customizations will be available in your target environment. And as you can see here in some of the images, so there's components which include things like entities, global option sets, web resources, workflows or processes, <clears throat> as well as things like reports and various templates you can create. And then as part of the export of the solution, it allows you to define whether you also want to include some of the system settings, like auto numbering settings that you might have for things like cases or contracts, um, relationship roles, and um, some various settings for email tracking and things of that nature. The various components that are comprised as part of a solution or that you can add as part of a solution include the schema. So these are things, again, like entities, fields, the relationships that you've created between different entities in the system, option sets, which can include your global option sets, so option sets that might apply across various entities, templates. So these can be email templates that you've created, um, contract templates, um, knowledge base articles, as well as your mail merge templates in the system. It also includes components of the user interface. So forms that you've created, as well as system forms, uh, views, charts, dashboards, the sitemap, so that's the application navigation, um, as well as any customizations you might have made to the various ribbons or buttons within the system. It contains additional items such as security roles, um, field security profiles, connections, reports, um, which you can include both system and custom reports in there, as well as the information about the corresponding publisher and the system settings. Additional things that can also be included as part of the solution are um, things like processes and custom code, so workflows, Dialogues, which also fall under processes, as well as business process flows and business rules. Okay. You can contain um, your custom actions that you might have created, any custom web resources, which can include things like JavaScript or images that you might be referencing, your plugin assemblies, as well as the SDK message processing steps, which are kind of defining when those plugin assemblies are firing. So as we're deploying modifications um, to different environments, and in this example we have a development environment, we have a user acceptance testing environment, as well as our uh, live or production environment. So we've got three different um, organizations or environments that we're deploying to. Okay. Um, so we might export our version one of a given solution from our development environment and deploy that into our next level environment or our user acceptance testing environment in this example. And then we're collecting feedback, right? It might be uh, modifications to what's been deployed. It might be, you know, some defects that need to be remedied. And so that's all coming back and you're integrating that and making those fixes back in your development environment. And then you'll export another version of the solution, which might be 1.1. I think my animation might have disappeared there. Um, and deploy that into your acceptance testing environment. And let's say everything's good, no more changes, we're ready to go. So then the 1.1 solution would then be deployed into our live production environment, right? Um, you know, in um, in practice, there might be a couple rounds of that deploying to your um, next level testing environment and deploying fixes back to that until you're ready to deploy your final solution into your production environment. <clears throat> So 
So then we see in this scenario, um, with the full animation built out, we have our 1.1 solution that we've now deployed up into production, and now in development, we're working on our 1.2 version. So let's talk a little bit about the customizations that um, we can make within the application. So an entity is a type of record. So it's um, essentially a table in the database that's going to store a collection of records of that type. Okay. Um, and it's going to um, contain the various fields and, um, and data elements within the entity. Okay. Um, it's going to contain the metadata that's used to describe how the entity is uh, presented to the end users that are accessing the application. Okay, so it contains things like the display name of the entity. What's it going to be called? Um, examples of entities include accounts, contacts, cases. Those are some of the out-of-the-box system entities, as well as any custom entities that you might choose to add on top of the system entities that are provided. A field within an entity contains a piece of data. So this is a column um, in the table of the database, right? Um, it's also referred to as an attribute. So you'll, you'll hear field and attribute kind of used interchangeably, um, both in system references and as you're talking to um, some, of, some of us as we're deploying solutions. I'm just going to pause a second um, and just do a quick check and make sure Debbie and, and Gonzalo, you guys are able to still see the presentation. Looks good to me. Okay, perfect. I'm having some um, issues viewing it, so I, I wanted to make sure you could see it. We're on slide nine, introduction to entity customization. Okay, perfect. And are, are you able to advance it? Yes, I can. Can you yeah. do that for me? Yep. Give me a second, I'm taking over. Okay, actually, now I can see it back. So I'm going to, I'll retake presenter mode from you then and see if I can continue. Okay, perfect. Thank you, that helped. Okay, so let's get back here. So moving on from our entities and fields, there's also forms and views. Okay, so forms are going to be the presentation layer that's displaying a given record um, to an end user or throughout the system. Okay. So a form contains fields, it might contain subgrids and other types of um, web resources or components. Okay. It also provides the client-side scripting and, and features back to the end user as well, such as some business process flow. So that's a guided flow at the top of the form um, to take the user through various steps of processing. It's also going to contain things like business rules, so the client-side logic that the user is going to interact with. So things like um, conditionally requiring fields or hiding and displaying fields or sections on the form. A view is a list of records. It has filter criteria applied to it to define which records are going to be included in that particular view. The view contains columns, which are going to render back the field values. You can also define things like a given sort for a view, so the default sorting, and then end users have the ability to resort based on the various columns in the view as well. Um, one more mention on the forms, so you can have multiple forms for a given entity, and those forms can also be tied to various security roles. So you can um, determine which form a given user is going to be presented based upon their assigned security role in the system. Now there are... Um, a couple types of entities within Dynamics 365, there are system entities. So these are the built-in entities that are created as part of the initial provisioning of an instance. Okay. Most of them can be modified, but there are some that are locked down and do not allow modification. Um, they cannot be deleted. Okay. They also cannot be locked down by a managed solution, by um, another solution that you might create or by um, one that you might deploy from a third party. Okay. 
There's also custom entities. So these are the types of entities that um, you would create or that are created um, by a partner or third party solution. Um, you require a specific security role within the system in order to be able to do these types of customization. So typically it's someone that's a system customizer or system administrator um, or via the import of a solution into the system that also can create entities. Okay. They can be modified um, or deleted with the exception of um, those entities that are part of a managed solution. So um, managed solutions prevent deletion of some of its components, and you have the ability to lock down certain components of a given managed solution as well. So in order to create an entity within the system, this is done through the customization area. So you'll navigate to settings, customizations, and then you can either go the path of going to solutions and opening up um, maybe a custom solution that you've created, or you can go right into customization, which takes you into modifying the default solution. Okay, again, any changes that you make through um, a custom solution are also going to be integrated back to that default solution. Okay. And when you go through the process of creating a new entity, which Gonzalo will demonstrate in a little bit here, um, you'll click a button that says new, and um, uh, you'll be presented with the form to define some information about the entity which you are creating. Okay. So the first thing that you'll need to provide is a display name for this entity. This can be changed. So um, if you create the entity and then you need to modify that slightly, you can do that, um, both the display name and the plural name, which is used in certain parts of the application, can be modified. Okay. You also need to provide um, a schema name, which is referred to as the name field on the form that you're seeing right now. This cannot be changed after creation. Okay? And you'll notice in the image here, in front of the name, there is a prefix. In this example, it's an SRE with the underscore. So again, this is tied back to that publisher that you have related to your solution and the prefix that's been defined for that. Okay? If you make modifications directly to the default solution and you haven't modified the publisher um, prefix for that, um, or if you create a new publisher and you don't modify the prefix, by default it will um, be set to new underscore. Okay. Um, in this case, we've modified it again to the SRE underscore. Okay. Some of the other things that you can define on um, creation of the entity include um, an image, a color for this, you can specify the ownership of the entity. So whether it should be organization owned or owned by a user or team. User or team is the more common type of ownership when you're um, creating entities within the system. It allows for assigning the records that are created um, and stored in that entity table to either a user in the system or a team. Organization-owned records are owned by the organization. They do not allow for assignment. Um, and that also has some uh, security implications that are tied to that as well. Okay. You can also specify things like where this entity is going to show up within the application, the different areas. So um, the default areas that you see are things like sales, service, marketing. Um, you can also add your own custom areas or rename the existing areas. So these might be um, called slightly different things in your own environments. There's also um, several different types of settings that you'll be able to define as part of entity creation. Um, these will include things like whether notes are available for this entity type, whether you can um, generate business process flows, whether auditing is enabled for the entity. Um, and knowledge management. So there's a, a slew of other settings that you'll be able to define um, as part of entity creation. Uh, most of those can also be turned on later. Some of them you can also disable if you have enabled them. Some of them, once they're enabled, you cannot turn off. Okay. Now, as your making changes or customizations or configuration modifications to the system, in order for those changes to be made available to the general population, to your end users, they need to be published. 
Okay, so if you add new fields to the system, if you add them to a form and you save those changes, but you don't publish them out, the end users are not going to see those until they've been published out um, to the application. Okay, so that allows you to be able to make modifications, maybe in your development environment, and when you're ready to publish them out, you can click the publish button and then it will make those available. Okay. There's um, a couple means of publishing within the system. You can publish changes that are specific to an entity. So let's say I made changes to the account entity within the system. Um, I can click publish within the account entity and that will publish just the changes for the account entity. There is also a publish all feature which will publish all changes that have been made regardless of which entity the change might have been to and push those out. Okay. So if you have a scenario where you might have multiple developers working on a solution, you'll want to be sure you're coordinating that when you're doing something like a publish all. Okay. And here we're seeing um, an image of the solution area. And one of the one of the areas where you can do a publish of um, changes for a given solution. So you'll notice on this screen we see one solution that's listed here. Okay, this is actually a managed solution because this was imported. Um, this is our data export service managed solution. Okay. At the top here, you'll see that there's a button here for publish all customizations. So if I were to click this button, it's going to publish all changes out to the system. Okay. You also have this function within the context of a solution if you have the solution open okay, or, um, again, the publish option within a given entity. This is also where you would perform imports and exports of solutions. So you'll see we're navigated here to settings, solutions, if you look at that top black navigation bar there. Um, and then within there, we see the list of solutions that have already been imported. And then under our... Um, our action buttons, we see we have the ability to import solutions. So this is where I can import a solution that I have available. It's also where I can select a specific solution that's listed here and export it in order to deploy it to another environment. We also have some other features here, things like the ability to clone a patch or clone a solution um, if I'm making different modifications to an existing solution in order to deploy updates or fixes to another environment. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about fields and, um, and what a field stores in the system. So uh, a field stores um, a single value of a given data type. Okay? Um, fields of the same data type can be formatted different ways. So for example, if we add a field, um, let's say it's a, a standard text field in the system, a text field has the ability to be formatted um, as uh, you know, an email address, for example, or um, a, a stock symbol or a, um, a phone number. There's different types of formats. So I might have multiple text fields on my form with each of them formatted a slightly different way, depending on the type of data that's going to be stored in that field or that's expected to be provided for that. It appears as a control on the form. It's also used within your views to display the data back for that given um, field. Okay. Um, it can be used as part of a query. So when you're building views in the system, um, you can use the fields that have been made available to, um, to set up the criteria or filtering for the record set that's going to be returned as part of that view. You can also use it for other um, customizations you might be making. So if you're developing a custom report or um, you're querying data through the API to render in other applications, obviously those data points can be um, queried and used from a filtering perspective. Again, as we mentioned before, this is stored as a column in the table. Okay? It's also referred to as an attribute. And these are the various field types that you can create within the application when you're customizing. So we have our single line of text. Okay? 
Um, <clears throat> this has a maximum of 4,000 characters. We also have option set. Okay, so this is a pick list in the system. Okay, it's stored as an integer value with associated labels that translate those integers. Okay. Um, there's two types of option sets in the system. There's a local option set that's entity specific. You can also create what's called a global option set that you can then um, leverage across different entities. Okay. Um, there's an image field type. So this allows for associating an image to a record, for example, a, a picture on a contact. There's whole number. Okay. There's also a floating point number. Okay. So this allows for up to five decimal places. Okay. We also have the decimal number, which allows for up to ten decimal places. Currency, excuse me, as well as multiple lines of text. Multiple lines of text can hold um, up to 100,000 characters. So if you're trying to decide between a single text field or multiple lines of text, you'll want to take that into consideration. Okay. We also have date and time fields. Okay, and those have um, various formats that can be specified as well for the date and time. Okay, um, you can have it translate to a local format, which is the default, so that takes into consideration the logged in user's specified time zone and their settings and translates the values of that um, date and time field to their local time. You can also have um, date and time fields that are time zone independent, so they don't translate to the local time. Okay. A lookup field, so this contains um, the, the GUID or link to another record or entity in the system. Okay? So if you have a relationship, for example, between accounts and contacts, right? So um, an account can be a lookup on the contact to show us which company or business that a given person is related to. And here we have an example of creating a new field in the system. Okay, so a similar layout to what we saw when we were creating a new entity in the system. So when you choose to create a new field, it will ask for a display name. So this is what's going to be presented to the end users on the form. Again, that can be modified after creation if needed. You have to provide a schema name for this. And in this example, you'll see my prefix is actually new underscore. So that's the default for any of the custom fields. And in this scenario, we didn't override the default prefix for the publisher. So we're at new underscore vehicle ID. The schema name can't have any spaces in it or, um, or uh, various symbols. So it'll strip those out for you. You have the ability to set the requirement level for the field. So whether it's optional, whether it's business required, which means it will be required to be populated in order to save the record, okay? or whether it's business recommended. Uh, business recommended puts a little um, symbol next to it to indicate that it's highly recommended that you populate that field if you know it, but it doesn't have an enforcement on save. Okay? You can also flag whether the field is searchable within advanced find queries in the system. So if it's set to not searchable, that field will not be available as a field that you can query. Okay. Whether or not field level security is enabled for the given field. Right? So if you enable field level security, and we cover this in a little bit more detail during our security tech talk, um, but if you enable field level security for a field, um, by default that field will not be available to any users unless they've been granted a field level security profile that gives them some sort of access to that field. Okay. Um, you can enable auditing for the fields, and if you have auditing enabled for the entity overall, then this will default to enabled, um, but you can also choose to disable it for specific fields. You can give it a description. Um, this will display as a tooltip for the field. Okay. We have a couple other um, indicators that are used for our interactive service hub. Um, and that's what the next two checkboxes are for. And then you have the type of field that we're actually creating. So um, is it a single line of text? Is it a whole number? Um, is it decimal? So in that data type is where you can specify that. And then you have um, the field type. 
And certain types of fields <clears throat> have um, the ability to be calculated or roll-up fields. Okay? So you might be creating um, a whole number field or um, a currency field that's a calculation of other fields or variables. And so you can specify in that field type that it's a calculated field, and then it will give you the ability to define what that calculation is. There's also what's called roll-up fields, and the lot that allows you to roll up um, related or child records into a max value. So maybe you have an overall entity that's your um, project, and then maybe you have hours that are being logged as child records below that project. You might have a roll-up field on the project to tally all of the hours up there. Or, um, or maybe on an account record, you might have the, actually out of the box, we have a tally for all the opportunities, right, and the value of those opportunities tallied all the way up on the account record. And depending on the type of field that you define, you'll then be able to select um, a valid format for that field. And those are the formats that we referenced previously. You can also define a maximum length, okay, as well as the IME mode for that. Now, lookup fields are a special type of field, which is basically the rendering of a relationship between two entities in the system. Okay, so a lookup field, again, holds a link to another record, okay, and it's storing um, the unique identifier for the related record, which is also referred to as a GUID. Okay? It displays as a hyperlink. So if you see a lookup field on a form, you'll see it displayed as a default hyperlink, and if you click on it, it opens that related record for you. Okay. Um, it displays the primary field of the linked record. Okay. So um, generally that's called the name field. Okay. So if we're talking about an account or contact, that's you know, the name of the account or the full name. In some cases for custom entities, you might be populating that with an auto number. Okay. Um, and lookups are associated with uh, one-to-many or many-to-one relationships, okay? And I see we do have a couple of questions in the window, so let's take a quick look at those. Um, uh, I, can, I can take them, Katie, if you want to continue. I, I'll be happy to, 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 chat, to, to write in the chat the answers, if, if you want, if you prefer. Okay. So up to you. Okay. Um, and I think we have to, I'm not sure if they can chat, if the chat will render back to them. Um, so I can send the just... responses. Okay. Yeah, I can Perfect. send it to them, yep. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and skip to the next. Um, and we've talked about um, most of the field properties on here, so I'm going to skip past this slide. But again, your field requirements, whether it's searchable, um, field level security being enabled, auditing, and then a, an overall description for that field. Now transitioning into form types, so <clears throat> there are a few different types of forms that some that are created by default when you create an entity, and then you can create um, additional um, additional forms that can be of these various types, right? So we have the main form. So this is used by the browser. This is used by the Outlook client, um, as well as Dynamics 365 for tablets and phones, right? So um, this is what's going to be the main form that's rendered back to the user. And you can have multiple versions of a main form. And again, those can be tied to security roles in the system, okay? Um, the mobile form, which is kind of our, our legacy client, um, our legacy mobile client form. So that's a, a specific form that's used for that mobile application. Um, the main form can be customized so that you can define specific attributes that will be rendered to um, Dynamics 365 for phones or tablets. Um, so, so that can be taken care of with the main form, and that's our, our new uh, phone client in our latest version that's available. So the mobile one, which gets deployed, is for our legacy. It's also used as a fallback for various browsers that might be unsupported. Okay. Um, the quick create form, this is a shortened version of the form, 
Um, it doesn't have as much design flexibility in it. It's meant for quick entry of a given record type. Um, so if you're thinking your, you know, think of working on, maybe I'm working on a case and I get a phone call and I need to quickly log that phone call in the system for something unrelated, or I need to quickly add a new contact in the system, but I don't want to navigate away from what I'm doing. You can leverage the quick create option in order to add a new record of a given type and you can specify the forms, business rules will still apply to it um, for that record creation. Okay. It's also used as um, a method for entering related records to a given um, record type within the system as well. So if we are working on, let's say, a case in the system and we need to add a related um, maybe we're adding a related contact or sub record for that case. If we configure it, um, we can leverage the quick create form as a method for adding related records to that. There's also what's called a quick view form. And this is a form that's used to show related information off, um, off a parent or associated record. So you might have scenarios, if we take the account and contact scenario again, where we have some information that's housed on the parent record or the account, but when we open a contact, we'd like to see some of that information on the contact record without having to navigate to the account record or having to replicate it locally to the contact. So the quick view form fills this need. It allows you to um, populate some of the information off the related record. So maybe we have the account address and maybe we have whoever their primary contact is and their website information, and we want to show that on any of their related child contacts when we open one of those contacts. So we can leverage the quick view form to do that. One of the other components that we have the ability to um, create and display within a given form or an entity is what's called a subgrid. So this allows us to display data from other records, typically they would be related, on a given form. <laughs> you can also select the specific view that the subgrid is going to use for displaying those records. Okay? And this will govern some of the filtering and determine which set of records we should show on the form. Okay? Um, it can be displayed as either a list or a chart. And then this also allows for users to open any of those related records that are displayed as part of that grid. So they can pop them open into a new window um, to display the related record. So if we go back to our contact account example, on the account record, we might have a subgrid that's going to display a list of all the related contacts for that account or all of the related opportunities or cases or some type of custom entity that you might want to show. Here we have an example of the form designer. So your main section is the form itself, and it's broken into a few different um, components here. So we have the header of the form, okay, um, and that's at the top, and that can be modified, and that stays locked on the screen as the user is navigating down the form. It's good, especially if you have longer forms, to have some of the important fixed information that you always want to be um, available to the user in that header. And then you have the main body, which is um, broken up into tabs and sections. And within each of the sections, you then have fields. Okay? And both tabs and sections can have um, the number of columns specified for the given tab and for the given section. So you can allow for multiple columns within that given section. In the example here, you can see the header um, has three columns across, whereas the um, general section within the general, what's called tab, is only one section across. There's also a footer on a form that you can specify. Again, that stays locked at the bottom. Um, so typically you might have something like created by or created on 
um, within the footer or modified by, modified on. Those are some of the common fields you might see in the footer of a given form. <clears throat> okay. Within the form designer, you have the ability to create new fields as well. So there's a couple uh, means for creating new fields. You can do it within the entity overall. Um, via the list of fields that are available. And then once you're in the form designer, you also have the ability to add new fields right from within here. Okay. And to add fields to the form, which um, Pathala will demonstrate in a little bit here, you can drag and drop. So I can drag from the right, drop onto the form where I'd like that particular field. You can also double click the field on the right and it will pop it on the form for you. Along the ribbon at the top, you have the ability to, if you have a given component selected, so whether it's a tab, a section, a field, um, you can click Change Properties, and it will pull up the properties for that given component and allow you to change them. Um, so you can change things like visibility, so whether it's displayed by default. Um, you can also change the labels for fields um, on the form themselves, as well as um, the label for things like your um, tab and section and whether they're visible. You also have the ability to remove components from the form. So if you add something and you want to take it off, you can select it and click remove. You also have an undo and redo option. Um, next we have some navigation options. So this allows us to change the focus. So what are we working on right now in the designer? Are we working on the body, the header, the footer, the navigation? And it will change where your focus is set. You can also do that via double click. A um, couple of the other options to the right here. So if you click on business rules in that top um, toolbar, that will open up the business rule navigation on the right side for you and allow you to add um, or modify business rules that exist for the given form or entity. Form properties will take you into the overall properties are, that are set for the specific form that you're designing. This will allow you to change things like the name of the field. It allows you to associate libraries to it, so web resources, and define um, events that might fire on um, open of the form or save of a given record type. Okay. There's also a preview mode that allows you to preview various um, states of the form, so a create form, a read-only form, um, a tablet or mobile view of the form. You also have the ability to enable which security roles will have access to this form if you want to define only specific security roles as having access. Okay. On the insert tab, which isn't highlighted here, um, but that allows you to add other components to the form. So if you want to insert a new tab on the form or a new section or a spacer or a subgrid, those types of things are controlled and accessed via the insert tab there. So let's move on to relationships within the system. So there are couple different types of relationships that you can create between entities in the system. Okay. So we have a one-to-many, which the reverse of is a, a many-to-one. Okay. Um, so on one entity, it's going to be a one-to-many. On the opposite that you're relating it to, it will be a many-to-one. So if I have um, the example, again, of our contacts and accounts, Contact has a many-to-one relationship to account. So account is a lookup on the contact. And then an account has a one-to-many to contact. So the, the reverse of that. So an account can have many contacts. And out of the box, a contact can be tied via the parent relationship to an account. There's system relationships that, or I'm sorry, there's also many-to-many -many relationships. I skipped that one there. So that allows you to create um, an association that allows you to associate many, many records of one type to many records of another type. Okay? Um, with many-to-many, -many, it creates a kind of a bridge table in the background that holds all of those associations. Okay? Um, the, the limitation with many-to-many -many relationships, um, which I think we'll cover in a little bit more detail later here, is um, you can't define anything else about the relationship. So I can say these two things are related, but I can't say why they're related. Okay. 
Um, there's also system relationships that are um, that are generated by default when you spin up entities. So, for example, you'll see um, by default, if you create a new entity in the system, the system will generate relationships to the user for created by and modified by, okay? Um, also to the user for the owner of the um, system. And also, depending on some of the settings that you flag on entity creation, it will create relationships to activities as well. Um, you can also create self-referencing relationships in the system. So this would, um, by default, you'll see things like a case and a subcase or a child case, um, accounts and sub-accounts. Okay? And you can also create your own custom self-referencing relationships as well. And those can also be leveraged for um, setting up uh, the hierarchy visual display of an entity. So um, going into a little bit more detail here, so again, the example of our one-to-many, um, which is also displayed as that many-to-one on the opposite. Um, you'll see in this example here, we have an account that can have many projects tied to it. A project will have one account tied to it in this um, in this relationship, okay? So the many-to-one is a, basically a shortcut back to that primary. So on a project, you'll have the lookup field on the project to account, and that would be a hyperlink back to the account that's been specified. Okay? And in the table, that's storing the GUID of the related account. When you configure a um, one-to-many relationship, there are the relationship behavior rules that you can define for this, okay? So this will control the actions that are performed on the related records when something is done on the primary record, okay? Um, and there's um, a few different types of relationship behavior. There's referential, there's referential restrict delete, there's configurable cascading, and then there's also parental. There are some restrictions on the number of a given type of relationship um, behavior that you can have for an entity. So, for example, you can only have one parental for an entity. I can't have an entity that's parented by more than one with that type of behavior. But the configurable cascading behavior type allows you to configure um, similar functionality. Okay. So, for example, the types of things that you can control with this are um, deletes of child records, merges, automated sharing or reassignment. So let's say we have our account and we have many contacts below the account. Um, what this drives is what happens when I reassign an account in the system? Are all the contacts reassigned automatically? Are all the activities reassigned? Or um, if I delete an account, are all the contacts deleted with it? Okay. So you can define these for your custom relationships that you create to determine what will what the type of behavior you can expect in the system um, when the parent or um, master record is um, acted on. Again, the types of actions that can trigger these behaviors. So assign. So when the primary record is reassigned, what happens to those? child or subordinate referenced records, when the parents or the primary record is shared, whether those child records are also shared with that user, um, when something is unshared, right, um, reparented, so if the um, related entity that's associated to the primary um, is reparented, whether that should also be reassociated. Um, what happens when a merge takes place, okay, so when the primary record is merged with another, um, what should happen to all these child records? Should they also be um, merged under the new master record? Okay, and also what happens on a delete? So if the primary record is deleted, what should happen to all those child records? Should they also be deleted or should the um, reference just be removed? And the various rules that you can set for assign, share, and reparent. So cascade all. So that means that that action is going to happen on all the related records, okay, of that for that given um, function. Okay. So if we had the example of cascade all set for the assign 
action, then that means that on a sign of the primary record, all the child records would be reassigned. You have the option for cascade active, so leave everything that's inactive as is and just cascade the action to all of the active records, right? So that's your open, enabled type of a status. Cascade user owned. So this would perform the action on the related entity records that are owned by the same um, owner as the user of the primary. Okay. And then cascade none. So that means nothing happens to the child records for a given um, for a given action. So if we use our assign scenario and we reassign that primary record, if we said cascade none for assign, then the primary record would get reassigned to the new owner, but all of the um, related entity records would stay as is and keep whoever their current owner was. Um, so similar for the delete scenario, so if the primary record's deleted, you have the ability to specify cascade all and delete all of the related records. You have the ability to just remove the link. So the lookup field that would normally house the link to the primary record would then be cleared and blank. Okay. Um, or you can restrict the delete. So you can say that um, if if there are child records tied to this or related records tied to it via this relationship, you can't delete the primary record. So the user will get um, an error message saying that they're um, unable to delete the primary because there are related records to it. All right, so the types of cascading um, behavior that are available, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, so we have um, parental, and for all of those rule actions, parental is cascade all. So basically whatever happens to the primary record happens to all of the related records. You have um, referential, okay, so um, the, the main rules include cascade none, um, and on delete, just remove the link. And then there's the referential restrict delete, which is um, defaulted to cascade none, but restrict deletion of the primary record. And then you have your configurable cascading. So by default, um, the rules are set to cascade all, but then you can change the specific behaviors for a given rule yourself. So now we're going to transition to talking um, a bit about business rules in the system. And we're catching up on, on some of your questions there. Okay. So business rules allow customizers to build um, client-side logic, which um, allows for the replacement of what um, a lot of the functions that would typically be done via JavaScript. Okay. Um, business rules can also fire service server side as well. Um, so this would also, um, they can be enforced during things like an import or if you have um, integration with another system as well. Okay. You have the ability to apply the rules to a specific form, all forms, or entity scope, which means it applies to all the forms as well as to server side. They're um, triggered when a record is opened or a field is modified um, that the rule has as part of its uh, conditions. And as you saw a bit earlier, um, they, they can be created from within the context of a given form. You can still set the, modify the scope even if you're within a given form. Um, or within the entity itself, um, within your solution navigation, you can go directly to business rules and add or modify business rules uh, via that means as well. Within a business rule, you can define conditions for when the various rule applies or the actions will apply, and then you can define um, the various action that you want the rule to um, take. So you can do things like show an error message, you can set field values, okay, you can set default value, you could make a field conditionally required, so you can make it um, business required or not required. You can set the visibility of a field, so you can have it display under certain conditions. 
Um, you can also uh, lock or unlock a field, so make it um, enabled or disabled. And here's just a, a quick um, basic uh, screenshot of what the rule designer looks like. So it was um, recently redesigned um, to allow for a bit more interaction and, and visualization on the screen. Okay, so um, you need to give the rule a name. You can give it a more detailed description. You'll notice in the very top right corner, you'll see where it says scope. And um, this one, for example, is set to all forms, but that's where you can modify it to be a specific form or, um, or all forms, as we have in this example, or set the scope to entity. And then you have your action buttons right below where the rule name is. So add allows you to choose, are you going to add a condition to this? Are you adding an action to this? And if so, what type of action? Okay. You can also use the designer on the right where you see the components and you see the flow and actions in order to select um, what you want to do from there and drag and drop, okay, if that's your preferred um, method. Okay. And then below, towards the bottom, it will start displaying to you what the rule is in a text. Okay, so you can see your if-then-else in there, and it'll also give you an overall visual image of the business rule on the left side of there. Okay. You also have the ability to take a snapshot of the business rule, so you can take a picture of it if you need to reference it somewhere. And um, that kind of takes us into view customization. So modifying um, views in the system. So again, these are lists of records, okay? And there are a couple types of um, views. There are um, system views, and then there are also personal views that can be created. And this is governed based on the user security rule as to whether they're able to create their own personal views, okay? And views define filters which are going to query and return a matching record set. Okay, so it's it's similar to if you're writing a SQL query, your where clause, right? Um, the queries are stored as fetch XML. Um, most of the clauses that you have in there can be dynamic or relative. Okay, so um, relative, uh, for example, could be something like equals the current user, right? So that's going to look at who the logged in user is and return what's relevant um, or those records that are owned, for example, by the current user might be your query. Or something like the last three months. Um, so you can have those types of clauses in there. You can also have static or specific. Um, so maybe I am selecting three records as part of this view, and those are the three records that I always want to see. Um, okay. uh, these are used to directly display records in the system. So you can navigate for a given entity. When you click on that entity within your navigation, um, by default, we return a list back to you. So that's a view. They are also used as the basis for um, displaying subgrids on the form for charts and some other features in the system, even for some basic queries for reports, right? And then the columns in the view are used to define the fields that are going to be displayed. So these are all the fields that you're creating. They can also include the fields that are called lookup fields, so those many-to-one relationships. Okay, you can store that lookup. And you can sort by up to two columns. The sorting has to be a field that's on the main entity. So one of the other things you can do within a given view is show a column that's off a related record that has a many-to-one relationship. So for example, if we take our account and contact example again, um, I might have a view for contact, and it's a list of my contacts, but I want to display the, um, the related accounts for that contact's account number on here, or maybe the website, which is an attribute that's stored on the account itself. I have the ability to render those in the view of the contact. However, those can't be one of the columns that I sort off of. By default, when you create a new entity, and for all of our system entities, we have system views that are um, created. You also have the ability to create custom views. 
hey, you can start from scratch doing a new view, or you have the ability to copy an existing view using a save as. So if you've you know, modified some of your existing views in there and you have a nice column layout and you want to use that for um, some additional custom views that you're creating, using the save as is a, a quick and easy method for doing that as opposed to having to re-add all those columns in the order that you'd like them in. Okay. Um, all of the public views, um, and those are created via customization, so those are a combination of any of the um, system views that are created as well as custom views that you've also created um, via the customization section, okay? Um, so system views has a terminology, and there's a couple types of system views in the, sec in the, in the system, so I should clarify here. Um, so when you create a custom view via the customization section of the application within the entity, and you publish that out, that view is published out to all users, and that's grouped under the system view section as well. Okay, so those are considered system views. If a user creates their own view, that's considered a personal view. And so when you go to look at a list of the given available views for an entity, um, you'll see the system views listed first, and then below that you'll see the, the personal views that either the user has created themselves and they only they have access to, or that someone has shared with them. Okay. And, um, and we'll show that when we get into the demo section, because that can be a bit confusing. Okay. Um, in, tip, in, in, um, in general, we recommend to kind of cut down on the number of columns that you have to have in a given view um, to remove any columns that are um, implied by the filter. So for example, if, your, um, if the name of your view and your, your filter um, is you know, my opportunities or my accounts, that's implying that the owner of all those accounts is me or the logged in user, right? And the filter shows that you know, owner equals current user, you probably don't need the owner column displayed in that view, right? Um, there's a default view that you can specify or that you must specify for an entity, and then the users have the ability to override this. So you'll set the default view, the users would see that one by default, but if there's another view that is more makes more sense to be their default view, whether it's a system one that you've pushed out or whether it's a personal one that they've created, they can override that and say, you know what, I'd really like this other one as my default view, and that's what they'd see as their default when they navigate to that entity. So that takes us to charts and dashboards in the system. Okay. So um, similar to views, um, you can have both system dashboards as well as um, personal dashboards. Again, this is driven by the user's security role and whether they've been granted permission to create their own personal dashboards. Okay? And also, by default, when you spin up a given instance um, of Dynamics, you receive a set of uh, dashboards that are um, provided as part of that. Right? Um, you can modify those, and then you can also create your own um, custom dashboards that you can publish out as well. Okay. So dashboards are comprised of various components. Okay. So they can contain views or lists. They can contain um, charts. They can have um, iframes. They can point to custom web resources um, that you've uh, added to the system. Okay. And a user can have access to multiple dashboards. Uh, you can set the default dashboard, and again, users have the ability to override that to set their own default dashboard. Okay. And on the top left, they have the ability to navigate between the dashboards um, to which they've been given access. Dashboards can be tied to security roles, so that you know if you have maybe you have sales and you have your customer service, and there's no need for your customer service rep to see the sales dashboard. It's kind of just adding to their list. You can specify the various roles that have access to those dashboards. And let's look at the system versus um, personal type of charts. So um, like dashboards, you can also create um, both system and personal charts. 
So system charts are created by a customizer of the system and published out. They can be included as part of a solution, and they can also be used in both system dashboards and personal dashboards, so dashboards that are created by a system customizer and published out to end users, um, or a personal dashboard that a user might create and share out. Um, they're available to all users, and they can um, be exported as a chart XML, okay, or imported from one. Personal charts can be created by um, the end users. Those are not included as part of a solution. Okay, um, same thing with personal views or personal dashboards, right? If I have users that are creating those that they're using um, for themselves, when I go to export a solution to promote that to another environment, those personal components are not going to be included as part of my solution. Okay? Um, personal can be shared with um, other users in the system or teams, as long as um, the, the source user that's trying to share them has permission. Um, they can be exported as, um, as a chart XML or imported from one. Okay? Again, those are personal, though. And that wraps up the first part of customizations. Okay. Um, and then next we're going to, I think we might have time for a brief demo. Um, I'll leave that up to Gonzalo. And then um, we'll transition into talking about extending the application. And I'll leave a, a couple minutes here in case we have any questions as we transition over. We've got a couple that just came in, so I don't know if you want to actually address them out loud or if you want to just keep responding to them by text. Okay. The first one is here in the IM window. Okay. Okay, I'll review those when they load, and then I can pop in some answers in there. Yeah, okay, just wanted to confirm if you can hear me and if you can see my screen, my monitor, or is it chopped somehow? So I can see it, but it does have a line down the... Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, like a it, sharing frame maybe, um, but I can't see it. It's not really yeah. disrupting. Let, let, me, let me try again. Or let me just share the window instead. And let me know when it comes up, please. It might be a better experience to share your whole desktop if this one doesn't work. Okay. Let me know if it works now. All right, it's loading. Yes, I just see the window, but you'll have to increase the font. You'll have to increase the resolution because it's very small. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I think I need to try it in a different way. I'm sorry about that. Trying my monitor instead again, because I was on the full desktop. Well, I don't know what this line is, but it definitely shows up as a kind of as a sharing window. You do see the full window, do you, Katie? Yeah, the yeah. It's, sales it's activity. fine. I can, it's yeah. fine? Okay. I can see the okay. full window. There's just a line. Just just ignore the black line going down the... <laughs> Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, th thanks for the for the first part, Katie. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, so, folks, I'm gonna take over now and do a go through a, a quick tour uh, on the um, on, on what Katie's just talked about. So, I'm, I'm, my name is Gonzalo Duns. I'm also a, a fast track program manager within the same team as Katie. The, the only difference is that I'm sitting on the other side of the Atlantic in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and so I'm going to go through a quick demo, like I said, um, uh, through the general, let's say, solution development and customizations. Oh, no, it's just, I think it's just fine now, I believe. The, the line just went away. Um, yes. Yeah, brilliant. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway. So uh, I'm going to show you the very briefly. Um, so talking about or starting with customizations, like like Katie was was uh, j just started f from where Katie just started from. Um, so if you go on settings and customizations, and this is just a vanilla system, so plain instance that I just spin up and. Uh, that I imported a, a, a simple solution that I'm going to demo just right away. But as uh, to start with, uh, uh, and if you just go to customize the system, then you will you will get, uh, let's say, the main window. Let me just try to bring that up properly. In here, sorry. Yeah, here we go. 
Hopefully it's okay. Yeah. So this would be the as you see here, as you see here in the top left the solution default solution. So this is the actually actually the out of the box solution that Katie just mentioned that contains you know all the entities, uh, all the components, everything that comes out of the box untouched. Um, so ready for you to use or to customize in, in some in some of the cases. Or, or to extend, uh, you know, creating your own um, components and, and, and customizations or configurations. Uh, the, other, the other point of menu here is uh, solutions, so the one that Katie also demoed. And in here, is, so I, I just imported this solution, I'll just show it to you in a moment, but um, just a recently, let's say, an out-of-the-box uh, vanilla, as we call it, instance, would have here no solutions at all. So an empty list, like Katie mentioned, and, and you would start from scratch and, and potentially you would um, create your solution as, as I would do here in creating the new button and providing all the name and publisher and all the details first and then go in the left hand and start um, creating new entities or or some processes or, or any sort of other additional components uh, that we've got uh, available in Dynamics 365. So, but but I'm going to skip that for you know conscious of time uh, instead of just starting from scratch. I did create a very very simple solution that contains just a small set of of components. Let me just try to put that window a little bit. Showing a little bit better in that screen. Just a moment. Yeah, here we go. So in this in this solution, basically, I created. If I go here to entities, as you can see, I've got two entities in my solution. So this will work uh, as as Katie, I believe, also mentioned, uh, on top of the um, out of the box, or out of, or on top of the default solution of the system. So as you can see here, you can recognize. Contact is definitely an out-of-the-box entity, uh, but vendor is not. Right? So vendor, I just created it as a, as a custom uh, as a custom entity uh, for this purpose. And then in here you see different uh, additional components that I just added, um, which in this case let me just sort by by type. So I've got contact and vendor as as entities. Then I've got uh, two processes that I'm going to show to you just in just in a moment. Uh, so one that is mentioned provide email address, and another one that just mentions phone number. I'm going to show you what that is and and what what is it doing. Um, I'm going to start with with the basics. So for um, for co for vendor, basically I created uh, the the entities. I just came here to entities and hit the new button. Define the display name, plural name, uh, type of ownership. So exactly everything that that Katie just mentioned that you can define, and then also added a few fields here in the top left. Yeah, sorry, in the left hand you pick fields, and then if I just select the custom ones, so I created email address, phone number, and VAT number. So just a, just as an example to uh, to, to for, for the for for the demo, basically. Uh, naturally, there are some other fields such as name, which you would uh, normally would use in a, in a vendor entity. I would say, which I just kept untouched. It is there all, uh, by default. So by default, if you just go ahead, create the entity, and save, the field name uh, will be created unless you you actually change it before you hit the save button. So that's just you know simple new entity, few fields. Uh, Keep the other ones. So all the others here are out of the box uh, system ones. Uh, so owner ID, business owning business unit. So these all these are required and, and are created in every single entity, uh, of course, and, and naturally in, in all the custom ones that you create as well. Um, and then for forms, uh, um, as an example, uh, so I just came to the vendor main form. I just uh, took it and customized it. Let me just go ahead and again resize the window properly. Here we go. And and basically, as you can see here, so following the so I've got the header, the footer, uh, the navigation, 
and the body. So I, I just threw the fields here from the right hand side of the screen. I just double click or dragged and dropped into the this section here, a general section in the form, and potentially I could go ahead and insert a new section or or, or additional columns or whatever. So just just for the purpose of the demo, I just created, I just kept it simple. So two columns, one for general, which contains uh, the, the fields that I'm going to work with. So name, owner of the record, name of the of the vendor, let's say, owner of the record, email address, phone number, and VAT number of of the vendor. And then also. Uh, I'm going to show just after this, but I also added a new section just below, as you can see here, a new tab and then a new section, which actually contains a subgrid. So as you can see here, you can add a subgrid. So it's that sort of a, a list within the form that shows re re related items, related records to that record that you're uh, visualizing at the moment. So in this case, whenever I open a vendor record, uh, I will also see contacts which are associated to this vendor. And how did I do this? So basically by creating uh, a relationship that I'm just going to show you just after this. Uh, somebody asked before in the chat window if we could create a new field out of the, or from here, from the form designer. You can. So basically in the bottom right here, you've got the new field option here. As you can see, and again, trying to resize the window, and here you go. Uh, so from here, you can actually um, throw the 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 window to uh, to create a new field, just in case you forgot, and you don't have to go back to the uh, to the main window of your solution to create a field. You can do it uh, directly from here. And when you're done, save, publish the form. Never forget to publish, otherwise it will not be available. Uh, to the to the general public, let's say, uh, it's actually very common for people to miss uh, s something that you just changed, uh, and you just suddenly you just realize that you forgot to publish. So, been there, done that. So, <laughs> take that uh, as a note and don't forget to do it. There are some other things such as business rules that Katie mentioned. I'm gonna uh, touch that in just in a moment so that you can also launch from from within the form. But I'm going to touch that just in a moment after this. I'm just going to cover the uh, relationships first. So I've got, I have created, like I mentioned, a new relation uh, between uh, contact and vendor. So basically a one-to-many relationship, which means one means um, vendor, one vendor, N means the other multiple types of records, so in this case related entities. So one vendor can have associated or related multiple contacts. This basically that's how I created the relationship. And you can just it you can just launch the create relationship um, um, window directly from here uh, where where you where you when you're customizing that particular entity. I'm just hang on for there for a a while, yeah, here we go, and it's basically from here that you do that, and you also have the relationship behavior that Katie mentioned earlier, and, and how would it work, so whenever I, as an example, if I share a vendor, and then and if that vendor has got associated, let's say related contacts, will those contacts be um, shared as well, yes or no? Well, it depends on the setting that you've got here on the relationship behavior for the sharing part. Okay, the, basically, this is how it works. Uh, so that said, means that I just, you know, created a simple, a, a pro, simple entity. I had, I did have to bring this up. So I, whenever you're creating a relationship. In, a, in an entity uh, within a solution, referencing or so bringing up another entity that is actually not in this solution of yours, you have to kind of uh, pull it, pull that entity in. And how do you do that? Basically, by hitting the add existing entity, which I had to do to bring on the contact entity into the system, okay, into this particular solution. So that's why I've got contact here and contact also 
in the system, in the, in the default solution in the system. Um, also touching a little bit in views, so I, I did customize, if I recall properly, uh, the views, uh, the view for uh, the active vendors. I could definitely uh, rename the, the view, but I just uh, took the uh, standard active views, active vendors view, and I just customized the columns here. So I hit add columns and then I pick them here from the list. They're not sh the ones that are sitting already there. They're not showing because they have already been added, as you can see here. And then I could also play a little bit with the size of the field and how does it show. Um, and here, as you can see, a number of pixels of the size of the column. I could configure sorting. So if I want to view to sort the vendors by name or by a different criteria, uh, or I can even edit the filter criteria so I, that I only want to show the active vendors or I want some other criteria. So it's that's, it's all about views and, and it's, it is available um, from here. Uh, so I did that, created everything, views, forms, uh, relationship, and also um, a business rule and a kind of a, what we used to call a workflow or a, a process, which I, that I'm going to show you just after this. So business rule. So you can go ahead and go directly to business rules and, and create it from here. Uh, and, and you set the scope uh, when you're creating one. Or if you're doing it from within the scope, uh, from within the form design that uh, naturally, uh, then it will apply to that uh, form specifically. I'm just going to edit this one that I created. I forgot to select it, I'll just double click. Here we go. So quite simple. Uh, basically, I just created a business rule that says uh, provide email address, which means that whenever I go ahead and create a vendor or when I'm editing a vendor record, it does have a condition. So when the condition is um, field, actually you can summarize it here. If email address does not contain data, then show error message, you must provide an email address, and that mess error message will show against the field email address. Basically, this is a very visual, like, like very visual, uh, um, much visual uh, kind of drag and drop, and uh, you can add new boxes there, copy, paste, cut, delete, take snapshots, uh, kind of designer, which was not there before. Uh, but we, we, we've introduced this recently, and it's much rich, uh, a much richer experience that allows you to do this uh, creation of business rules. So I just created this simple one so to ensure that whenever my users are working with vendor records, that they actually are enforced uh, to provide an email address. I could just, you know, sh instead of uh, setting or showing an error message, I could change that. Instead of showing an error message, I could do, just do it in, in a different way and, and just, you know, show some information or some additional uh, additional um, step that needed to be done. Uh, I, I'm not going to change this one because it's already active, so if I needed to change it, I need to deactivate it and then um, set, edit it and then activate it back again. On the top right, and, and typically, actually, actually, let me go ahead and do that just to show you something, which is something that oftenly I would say you could forget or you would forget. I, it happened to me several times, which is the scope. So you can define that this business rule will will apply to a particular form, to a very specific form, to all forms, or to the entity itself. So basically, with this you can control actually kind of your data entry quality, let's say. Uh, so imagine the case where you want you have some, several call center agents that you've got a, a very specific form that they use for vendors to, to fill in information for vendors and you're very strict, you really want them to f fill in um, specific fields, you want to show error message, you don't want to to allow them to, to save the record if, if it's not if it's not complete. So you can you can do that and and, and, and set the business rules specifically to that to that uh, to, with the scope for that form. Or if you want that all across uh, the forms, um, you, you you just change it to all forms. 
or if you want to kind of enforce it at the kind of at the kind of at the platform level in some sense um, you will you would pick it as entity in here as you can see so this is kind of a very kind of a let's say a a shortcut a kind of a tricky way to make sure that this business rule will apply um, regardless where you are uh, and that that will definitely work and help you uh, um, let's say enforce your your data quality uh, when when your users are working on the system so basically establishing and enforcing your business rules that's that's actually just putting the the, the actual uh, result uh, next to the name of, uh, of the functionality. So I'm going to go ahead and activate, and then I'm going to show you another thing that uh, I did. So whenever I uh, um, I create, a, a, sorry, sorry, whenever I edit a vendor record, I set a process. Let's call it a workflow. Uh, okay, that that it will be doing something and. And this is kind of showing a little bit of automation, or what can you do just by you know clicking here and there? There's no code. Be, there's no code that you need to to type in. You don't need to be a developer to to do this very simple customization, which is so. I created a new process of type workflow or category workflow. Uh, the scope is organization, so it does apply all across the organization, regardless the business unit. It will run in the background, so which means that it's, it's. I mean, the user will not be sitting there for this process to complete. It just, it just will happen asynchronously. Will be running asynchronously. And when does it start? When, so when, it, when is it triggered? Right? It is triggered in this particular case only when certain records, record fields change. Right? This is, this was my criteria. And which fields? phone number. So I just said that whenever I change a phone number on a vendor record, something or this process will run, and what will it do? So I just, I just added a couple of steps. First step, I will add a note with the phone number update with some information, kind of, kind of auditing that, you know, phone number was updated, and, and this will be doing kind of just creating a note and in the note itself, as you can see here, it will just write phone number updated to, and then kind of the variable. I'm just passing the variable there of the phone number that, just, that I just updated. And then here, the regarding, you should refer to the actual vendor variable, which basically it will be set regarding to that specific vendor record that you're touching on that specific moment okay so create a note in that same vendor record saying or kind of auditing that the phone number was updated and then and what's the new number that was updated to and as a second step it actually also sends an email to a manager uh, mentioning that i'm going to so it's just send an email create a new message just going to show you the what's what's in it just briefly. So I just, it creates a new email message from admin user to a certain contact. So this is just fixed. I, I didn't spend too much time in in setting a, a different recipients there. It's just fixed, just to show you what uh, what does it do. Um, set the subject of the email. So phone number updated to vendor, and then the name of the vendor, and then this is the body uh, of the email, which contains actually this is a kind of duplicate, but doesn't matter. Just for the for the purpose of the demo, it will just work, and then the set regarding as well to that specific record. So I'm going to show you how all these pieces work together. So the solution is was imported, was published, created. Sorry, in this case it was imported. I didn't create it in this system. Uh, I just exported from that other system, imported it here um, directly from here, from this screen here, chosen the file, and then imported, publish all, and solution is up and running. Forgot to show you something very important that Katie also mentioned. Where will the vendor entity show up in my menus, right? In here, areas that display uh, this entity. In, this, in my case, sales and service. So the vendor 
menu will show up in sales and service areas basically okay so I'm going to show you how all this works so if I go here to uh, sales and I have this, I'm going to have to scroll to the right because all the custom entities will be showing if unless you go beyond your customizations and, try and start customizing your ribbon that's something that we could explore in another session as well but basically vendors can be accessed through here sales and service like I said and you just click and go to the vendors and by default I've set the active vendors view so in these and these here are the system views like like Katie mentioned so those show up first so active and inactive vendors show up but if I wanted to create a personal view or if somebody had shared the person uh, personal view with me those would show up just in this area here okay so I've created one as an example but I'm going to create a new one just to show you and hopefully everything will run smoothly as as I expect my connection is not so good today and oh, hoping that my I've played so much with this instance that uh, hopefully uh, it, it won't let me down right okay so yeah new vendor uh, so I'm gonna just name it vendor number two just as an example and as you can see so immediately I've got an error message there right so the actually it's, this is the business rule kicking in right email address I haven't provided an email address yet uh, and because it's not there um, the business rule is, is checking it and it's showing an error message you must provide the business rule so if I go ahead and try and save it does not allow me and it, on the bottom right you see why you, and also be next to the field of course but on the bottom right you see the message that I put in as, as an error if I just go ahead and say okay let's say uh, test at domain.com it doesn't really matter that's it the error goes away which means that business rule is actually a client side code which is running and, and checking uh, uh, wh what's going on with the fields that you're working on so I saved and as you as you can see record is saved I can just go back to the vendors list and it's there right now I'm going to show you the other piece working so I showed you um, creating the vendor record the business rule let's associate let's relate a contact here I do only have a contact in the system if I'm not mistaken I, um, if I click the plus plus button I can then go and look up as you can see here I've got a, a contact there or if I want to look up for some more which I don't have I'll just select it add and it's done which basically means that for this vendor I now have this contact which is related to the same vendor and this is due to the relationship to the one-to-many relationship that we created and then due to the grid the subgrid that we added in the form okay now the other part of the demo to uh, which was if you recall if I update the phone number it should trigger a process in the back end that will create a note and we'll send an email or we'll create an email message to be sent out to us to in this case to a certain contact okay I'm just going to put it some dummy number here and uh, go ahead and save okay and re remember that the process is actually asynchronous 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 sorry so you don't really see it happening in real time in here so there's no notes showing up nothing else pops up if I just refresh the page if I'll just go back and on you see that so clearly the phone number is there if I go back to the to the record here we go so a note was created so this was no magic it was really the the workflow I'm going to show you to proof how it ran a note was created with its title phone number updated and the detail phone number updated too and an email message uh, should have been created let me just bring up uh, the advanced find it's actually much faster to get there so I'm going to show you email messages all emails and here we go so there there was a new email created as you can see here from the admin you oh sorry let me go 
code stuff. From the admin user to the contact that I show you regarding that same vendor. And it's still pending send because I don't have an email configuration done uh, on, this, on this system. Now let me show you how the email looks like within CRM. Oh, it doesn't look like just bring it. Yeah, here we go. So subject, pending send, uh, from to subject, pop populated with the variables there. There's a tracking token already. And here we go. It's kind of duplicate, but this was part of the, of the email. Uh, template already. So the, basically, the process ran fine, and it completed, and and it and it actually did what it had to do. And how can you actually check um, what happened, or which, how many times? Imagine that you've done this several times, uh, or you have additional processes uh, within uh, the vendor entity. How can you check which ones which ones ran for it? Very simple. If you go here to the top background processes, you see that I have a system job associated view that actually shows me which processes have run for this particular record. And then here we go. This was my so this is my time. Don't be scared. It's not that late for some of you. Uh, and so the process named phone number ran and oops, sorry about that. Might be something to t oh here we go yeah yeah I've I've messed so much with my instance that I I get some errors here and there but here we go so basically this is the result uh, you may recognize this from the designer of the process uh, but this is uh, the actual resulting window uh, of of how did the process run so it was regarding this vendor record the job owner was my user so that i'm logged in with when it was created when it was completed you know sometimes it does take some time to complete so the times may differ um start reason was because it, it just was just got triggered or started because the record field has changed so that means that you've, if you've got different options there to trigger the start of the process, uh, you would know from here uh, which one triggered the process. And then also, if, if which steps have uh, completed or failed, or uh, if you have if then else conditions in here, which I, I did not put, but you would see exactly the flow of execution uh, for those steps uh, of, of the process. Okay, so that basically um, is um, um, kind of in a nutshell, um, without even showing you showing you any code, just clicking here and there and customizing how far can you go and how simple can you make things work for you in Dynamics 365. So that that kind of wraps up or puts a lot of color in 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 what Katie just presented in in the past hour or so. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and, and keep, keep dropping your questions in the, in the chat if you want. Uh, we're going to have some uh, additional time in the end, uh, hopefully. I'm going to bring back uh, the slide deck uh, to, the, to the presentation. Just give me a moment. And we'll pick it up again and continue with, with part two. Part two and, and actually the, the next parts uh, are, are going to be a little bit, I'd say, faster to the than the, than the first one or shorter. Uh, although we do have still have a lot of slides to cover, but uh, some of them are just uh, informative for you to know exactly uh, what to look for. And since you will have the uh, the presentation after the after we end the session, um, it will be uh, useful hopefully for you. So extensions. Um, so on top of configuration and extend of and customization, sorry, that we just covered. <coughs> pardon. Uh, we can extend um, Dynamics 365, or what we used to call CRM Online. And, and sorry if I still say CRM Online every now and then, but it's just a bad habit. Uh, but I, it, I, I, may, I may say it uh, every now and then. So, but extensions basically is uh, uh, coding, extending, uh, uh, how, 
further on than that further more than what you can do with mouse clicks and and keyboard types or keystrokes okay um, so this would be uh, typically a job for, for your developers within, within your team to do and they would definitely make use uh, of the software development kit for Dynamics uh, 365 apologies for the outdated screenshot it should be actually Dynamics 365 here and we've already got the one for for 8.2 which is Dynamics 365 available if you, if you just look it up on the web uh, or on downloads uh, or Microsoft downloads it, it, it will just pop up for you to download it so this piece of so this package basically contains uh, all that you need to start developing uh, your pieces of code in the formats of uh, plugins .NET code workflows c custom workflows uh, and, and, and further on in the format of, of JavaScript, for instance, client-side code and, and much more than that. So I'm, I'm conscious that uh, um, we may have, a, 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 let's say, a, a different uh, profiles in the audience, so more or less technical, more or less knowledgeable about programming. So with that said, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I promise that I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go too deep nor nor too easy uh, just try to trying to balance and and to cover uh, what it takes uh, for you to have a good understanding of of what extensions in Dynamics 365 means so this is kind of a, a, an older screenshot as well it's actually part of a of, of MSDN or, or TechNet for for some time already which basically comes from the on-premises times as well where but you know, with online, you don't really have access to 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 to, to SQL database, but uh, this kind of shows or sh shows you the uh, the different ways or the different uh, types of extensions that you can uh, make use uh, in Dynamics 365. So, in the right hand, in in, in order, web services, uh, plugins. Uh, Client applications, reporting processes. You know, I mentioned workflows already, business process flows, and then uh, business rules, field validation rules. So it is really a a a, a good catalog of, of different capabilities and options that you've got to to extend your Dynamics 365. I would say I could even um, um, say that nobody or all, almost no no customer can can really survive without doing some sort of customization or extension somehow at least until today and I've been in dynamics for uh, nine years now so I haven't seen one implementation that was uh, just purely out of the box there was always something a new field a new entity a new view created uh, which is so it's very common so don't be uh, scared or with having the need to do that uh, we just provide the out of the box as a as a good starting point and as part of our uh, product strategy to provide you those uh, um, capabilities but definitely uh, configuration customization and extensions are there for you to make use of them so just moving right right ahead so I didn't uh, demo it but if you go in your instance and go to settings customizations uh, there is an a, a menu entry for a uh, developer resources this doesn't show really uh, it shows a little bit uh, small in small font but you will find there a very good uh, a, a great summary I must say of the mo some of the most important resources that that you should be aware uh, in, when developing in Dynamics 365 not only you've got the the endpoints for web services discovery services and as an example but also uh, uh, your organization ID you may need that uh, in, in different situations but also in the top with the getting started um, uh, section there are links for for uh, the SDK download that I just showed you um, some sample code uh, you know and a lot of uh, developer references in forums that will help you uh, ramping up or, or actually uh, completing accomplishing the the extensions that you, that you're performing on that moment at that moment of time uh, so starting with uh, with web services uh, 
so it's all about web services, right? So you can't really, with online, um, access uh, our uh, the SQL database in the back end uh, as you used to do sometimes in an unsupported way, I must say, uh, <laughs> in on-premises. Um, so if you want to do something with dynamics, uh, if either if it's uh, um, customizing um, or creating records, uh, retrieving records, uh, all sorts of things, it's always about uh, web services. And we've got the, let me summarize this into uh, the, uh, so the web API, the first one, is kind of a very recent as well, and we're focusing more on, the, on this ABI, which is a, a, a REST API uh, that will allow you to, uh, uh, to, to do uh, basically what you, what you need to do uh, uh, within your organization, not only, like I said, in terms of data, but also in terms of metadata. Um, and, and with investing and, and, and putting more effort into that um, uh, new API um, and, and kind of uh, deprecating or stopping vesting, that what, that's what deprecated means in the SOAP API, as we used to call it, um, SOAP Web Service Endpoint, uh, which, which we used to have or still have for, for, quite, uh, for several versions already. Uh, so with that said, and moving along, uh, connecting to the web API is actually uh, what we used to call the modern API or modern authentication, which requires uh, uh, a little bit more than just a plain username and password. Um, but but this is definitely um, available in all the resources uh, to help you, and also your fast track program manager can help you in in make start making use of this modern web API as you go, because you know it, it is if you if you're coming back from the old the old style of web service calls and soap soap endpoint, and, and you're moving to this new one, it's it's definitely a different approach. So I'm just putting it here uh, just for you to be aware uh, of the difference there. Uh, and basically, uh, and this is a, a kind of a showing an example uh, of what you need to do if you're consuming data from this new web API. So let's say that you've created a portal or a page that is actually fetching data uh, from Dynamics 365, in this case, the list of accounts. So it is a custom application or custom client application, let's say, so that you just created. It is a it is a a website that you created, and because of that, and due to the the web API uh, requirements, you would have to register that uh, within uh, the Azure uh, Active Directory as, as an application. It's kind of trusting, re registering the client application to connect and to be able to consume that data. Once that is done, you can definitely make use of that and as you can see here in the right hand, uh, retrieve records uh, from Dynamics 365 from a, a simple custom web page that you just developed. Plugins. So plugins are no more, no less than pieces of code in, in, in .NET that you would develop within Visual Studio um, using the, or, or including, or, or referring uh, the, 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 the Dynamics 365 SDK DLLs. And, and with that said, you can uh, basically do all the magic, uh, do all the manip manipulation and logic uh, to, to be run before or after the, a platform, the platform operation, or and synchronously or asynchronously, uh, like I mentioned earlier. So synchronously means that it will run immediately and the user interaction, the user interface will be waiting and pending for that operation to be completed and so that the user control is returned. Uh, or eventually, if it fails, it will pop up with an error and user control is returned, but it will act, it will uh, um, occur uh, synchronously or asynchronously, like we just saw in the demo, uh, which will just run in the back end um, as soon as possible. Typically, it's within the next few milliseconds or seconds, uh, but 
you know it will just happen just after that and user user um, control is not uh, pending or waiting for that piece of plugin to to complete and then again not spending too much time here because I'm it's uh, a bit beyond the an introduction level for a uh, solution uh, development uh, but basically um, this is uh, the, uh, what we call the execution pipeline for a certain operation. Let's say when you're saving a record, when the record is being committed in the database, uh, where can you hook uh, your pieces of code? Let's say, can you, can I, when I save a contact, can I uh, kind of trigger my piece of code to run just before the contact is actually committed to the, to the database? The answer is yes, so you would register uh, perhaps on a pre-validation or pre-operation uh, stage, and this is purely um, uh, when you're registering the, the plugin itself, or it, if, it, if it happens just after the, the, the record is saved, so post-operation, so whenever the the, the contact is actually saved and committed to the database, then my piece of code will run and will do X action uh, or X manipulation of data that I just uh, developed within my code. Uh, simple, just as an example, Visual Studio, C Sharp, Class Library, include the SDK libraries, uh, as simple as this, uh, dump, dump your code there, and sign the assembly, um, uh, compile, run, or or publish, uh, uh, and then and then register. Sorry, sorry, publish is not the word. Um, compile and then and then uh, uh, generate the DLL and register the 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 plugin in in the in, in the platform, and it will just start working uh, as, as you go. You can always work and debug that, that piece of code in, in, in with, with the help of Visual Studio as well and in online. Uh, and, but anyway, uh, putting it simple, develop, uh, build, register, and you're done. Here we go. So register the assembly. This is done with the plugin registration tool or if you've had, if you have installed uh, the develop, developer extensions within Visual Studio uh, you can always uh, do that from within uh, there that, that Visual Studio or if you're using some additional third-party tool that, tools that actually call the plugin registration tool then, then you can all you can also do that register the steps so basically you're determining exactly when that piece of plugin will run. So register the new assembly, and I'm going to say that it's going to run, if you see in the top right, uh, starting from top to bottom, it will run on the create of an account, and then below you will see that it will run post-operation, so after the record is, the account record is created and committed to the database, and it will run synchronously on the server side, okay? That, that's basically the definition. There are plenty of other combinations and other things you can do here, but basically this is a summary of it. And then jumping to client side. So client side will be all about, all about JavaScript. So with JavaScript, you can manipulate, you can control. We had some questions before around that. How can I format a certain field? How can I control or enforce that a certain um, that I've got this certain behavior uh, when a form is loaded and certain fields uh, are, um, are are complete, uh, you can run and, and, and do that uh, within JavaScript. I'm going to rush a little bit, uh, just uh, conscious of time and uh, waiting for, uh, hoping that we've got some Q&A still, but keep dropping the questions into the chat, Katie, if you can. Um, uh, Please, please respond to them. Uh, the on client side scripting, uh, you are able actually in the form to, to trigger the, that those pieces of code in different events. Uh, so on load, on save, uh, and and all the ones mentioned here, uh, basically to, to to have that piece of code running whenever uh, whenever it's it's it, it's required. And in here, I'm just showing the object model uh, that you have access to. 
with the client side scripting, so JavaScript. Uh, so basically, you can um, work at at the top level or just with a page or with the context or with the attributes of that record or navigation. So you, you will have access to all these different components uh, when you're coding your JavaScript client-side client side, uh, piece in, in Dynamics 365. Some examples, you'll find these uh, on TechNet, don't worry, I won't spend time here. Another one here with context, another one here with using the UI. Uh, and I'm going to jump immediately to some best practices. So that basically wraps up part two. I'm going to go uh, a, a bit quicker just summarizing. And again, because we're not spending too much time in, in real examples, but, uh, but basically summarizing some best practices within solution development, uh, avoid including uh, option sets in quick finds. So quick finds are those quick find views, so within an entity. So option sets are very kind of a kind of very special fields, as you know, they're kind of drop down fields. Uh, and so that basically um, creates a lot of uh, um, additional effort at the SQL level and, and load that may create a very complex query. So whenever possible, avoid including those in your, in your view. Uh, Performance-wise, and coding and running your or creating your queries, um, prefer using no lock and define the column set. So it's kind of a in a SQL you would select with no lock and and you would select the top 50 records and and not the top or select star select all the records. That's a, another best practice. The other thing is on performance for doing batch operations. So if you're doing batch operations for creating records or doing a, a, something else, you can batch them. You can put, create batches of, of several dozens or, or hundreds of, of, of requests and send them in one shot uh, uh, to Dynamics, and the platform will handle that as an execute multiple request. Uh, Plugin execution, so disable the keep alive. So there's a keep alive option that kind of, if you, if you don't disable it, it, it will trust that the connection is always open, which is not true if it has expired already. So within your code, uh, explicitly put the keep alive as false, and that will allow you to check whenever the code is running, check uh, if, if, um, if you should open, reopen the connection again, basically. And then again, preferably do not declare global variables. Otherwise, it will be uh, might not provide the, the, the expected result. Uh, and then, when registering the pl the plugin, also uh, all, make sure that you select only the attributes that you're touching with your pieces of code. Otherwise, it will just lock the whole table in the back end and and may contribute negatively for overall performance. Exception handling, make sure you handle those exceptions. Again, not being too 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 complex, too deep here, uh, just for you to be aware. Um, avoid synchronous calls using JavaScript. So JavaScript is client side. Uh, don't rely on, 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 on synchronous. If it takes time, if you're querying an external system, user will be waiting for that. Okay, if it takes time, user will be suffering and waiting for that. And again, don't do any sort of access to the DOM object model. It will be unsupported, or it is unsupported, and avoid unsupported code. You can, and you can use the custom code validation tool that you can look up, and that will help you find any um, any any piece of code that has that. And again, well, this is kind of summarized. I know we're top top of the hour, briefly going through what Katie just mentioned before. Uh, summarizing the uh, development life cycle and how can you manage or how do we recommend you to manage it and roughly again the manage and unmanage solutions the difference between them and structure or solution structure approach if you're working with a very complex scenario with multiple components 
preferably you can split different components uh, or by components, so one solution for certain types of components or one solution for a certain area of your business. This is just an example. Make sure you reach out to your fast track program manager for more information. And then uh, with uh, with your uh, solution development system and Visual Studio uh, uh, Team Foundation server as well, you can you can work with that and make it work um, to help your version controls and, and new releases uh, whenever they come out. So I'm just going to go real quickly again. This is the last slide, I promise, and Q&A. We're just actually two minutes after the hour. I don't know, Debbie, do you want to... Do we still have some remaining time, or are there any other questions, or should we just uh, wrap up? Looks good. Looks like you guys have handled all the questions. I would like to call the attendees' uh, attention to the survey link that I posted in the window. I put that in the conversation window several minutes ago. Uh, your feedback is very valuable to us. Please click the link, enter your email. You'll be taken into the survey. And then our survey is on a voting scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being the best score possible and then be sure to click on the Submit button at the bottom. I also have activated a poll. It's kind of the same thing, but it's slightly different, so it's on your Surveys tab. Um, please, could you please rate your overall satisfaction with today's Tech Talk? And with that, uh, uh, looks like, Giancarlo, it looks like you guys have actually responded to all the questions by text as they've come in. So any final words before we conclude our recording? Well, for, for my side, uh, just... Thank you, everyone, for attending. I really hope it was it was valuable for you. I mean, especially part one, you know, covering the basics and then the demo to put, to put some color on, on that. And actually, the second part was a bit faster. But uh, again, I don't want to uh, uh, be too deep because we may have mixed audience here. Uh, so definitely. To, to wrap up, just thank you everyone for attending, I, and I really hope to, to see you again soon in another, in another session. Great. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's Partner Infopedia web conference. The web conference recording will be available at the same registration site within 24 hours. Again, don't forget to take our survey and vote on our poll. And with that, uh, again, thanks again for logging in and joining today's web conference.